Hey, welcome to Project Recovery, a podcast about addiction. More importantly, it's about recovery, and it's brought to you by our friends at Reprieve Recovery, which is located up in Morgan. Uh, you know, they've got a great facility. I'm already hearing great things about what they're doing. So for more information, go check them out, ReprieveRC.com. Uh, it's an all-female facility. Yeah, yeah. Eight, eight, eight beds, 8 to 12, I believe. I think that's better. I think that less distraction. Well, you know what? Okay, so the one I went to was a co-ed, yeah. and I understand. It because I think sometimes, depending on your addiction and your trauma, that might be a safer space. Mm -hmm. But I also think that we live in a world that's co ed, so mm -hmm. you've got to figure out a way to coexist. So it just depends on your level of need and what you feel comfortable with. And so I, I can see the, the positives and the negatives in both. Well said. Uh, you know, Dr. Matt was interesting. What's that? You walked in. Yeah. You did what you normally do. You introduce yourself to the guests. Yeah. You went to the lovely Tia, who we're mm -hmm. going to hear from in just a bit. Yep. And then you shook Riley's hand. I shook Tia's hand. I know, but you shook Riley's hand. Yeah. Do you not remember meeting Riley? I did. He said, I'm Riley. And I said, hey. Do you know Riley has been a guest on this podcast before? <laughs> <laughs> But that, let me. Go, but here's I the deal. thought you looked familiar, but, but here's I, the deal. I, I didn't recognize him either. I okay. ran into him at the gym yesterday morning. Oh, jeez. And really? he came up and introduced himself. And, and I you said, didn't recognize him either? Well, then I saw him. I was like, oh, my gosh, that's Riley. Let me put this visual in your head. There once was a menacing man who walked around Ogden who had knives oh. hanging from Riley. ropes. Oh, you know what? That's you don't Riley. look the same. Yeah. You don't look the I've same. I've lost some weight. Yes, you've <laughs> lost a lot of weight. Yeah. You did look familiar, though. Yeah. And well, we're from Morgan, right? So. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Right. Oh, so I'm embarrassed. I, I am no, sorry. No, don't be embarrassed because right. I, I, mean, I was taken back, too. And I was like, holy cow, Riley, let's get you in on the podcast. And let's talk about the wonderful things you, you were you doing. You set me up. I did. And, and, <laughs> I, and right before you came in, I go, this is what we're going to do. And then you came in and you introduced yourself to Riley. And he looked at me. He's like, we got him. And I was like, yeah, we got him. So, no, Riley, what are you going to do, my man? That's a good joke. I like uh, it. Since last time I've been here? Yeah. Oh, I moved to California and went to Clear Lake and I got became a registered substance abuse counselor out there for guys paroling from San Quentin prison and, and whatnot and then stayed there for about a year and then I came back and I got my job back at Weaver Human Services and um, started my own nonprofit called the Godfather Foundation and I became the president of the Ilano Club in Ogden and we we're we're changing lives and making a difference on a daily basis. And so when you talked to me yesterday about the Alano Club, I mean, I know a little bit about it, but not a lot. And I know that we went to an Alano meeting while I was in recovery or in, in treatment myself. And uh, for those who don't know, what is the Alano Club? The Alano Club is a, a place that you can come in recovery and have a safe place to go. You can come and you can get food. We have a little diner inside it. We have meetings throughout the day there. Um, different and, and, all meetings. Yeah, and, and, and you have to pay, right? Well, to be a member, it's $12 a month to be a member. Mm -hmm. um, but we also wanted to be open for the newcomer to come in and see what recovery looks like. And then they hopefully become a member and can hang out and be a part of what it looks like to be in recovery. So, Well, we've often said on this podcast, the opposite of addiction is an abstinence. The opposite of addiction is what, Dr. Matt? Connection. And when yep. you find a place like the Alano Club where you can make those connections, you can find your community, and you can find like-minded individuals who are battling some of the similar but different things that you are, it's a safe place to come. And you guys do something that's interesting, and I found about this off air, it's called a marathon meeting. For those who yep. don't know, what is a marathon meeting? A marathon meeting we usually do during the holidays, where where it's one meeting after another for the whole day. Mm. So because it's so heightened at that time, and a lot of people need to be able to be able to find holidays the can be really tough. Really so stressful. at any given point throughout that day, you can Stop go in there in, and in, find a meeting. Oh, that's yeah. great! That's and great. and so uh, the Lano has uh, one in Ogden, uh, one in Bountiful, two in Salt Lake. Yep, and uh, it, it, it's just kind of a cool place to go. Yeah, it's really cool. You can come there. We can. We have a fun there that we call Turn the Page that if you can't afford your breakfast or your dinner, um, we donate to that and we can help somebody that's you know new or new, freshly new and off the streets to get them breakfast or dinner and they can sit down at a meeting. We do a morning meeting at 7 a.m. every morning and big book study and, and we just talk recovery. It's interesting you bring up the big book, book because you said there's kind of a tie-in yeah. with the big book and Alano, although it doesn't specifically mention the Alano Club. Right. You're understanding that this is what it is. 
Yeah, so there's a there's a story in the big book that tells about a guy that got here to Ogden and ended up at a club and ended up up at, at a camp up where I went. Valley Camp. Yep. And and it's in the big book, right? It's one of the stories in the back of the big book. And so it has a lot of history. We're celebrating its 77th year, and we almost had to close the doors a little while back because mm-hmm. it was just not – it's not – it just wasn't – people weren't coming. So I took over. Tia and I took over, and we we opened up the diner till 8 o'clock at night. We started – I because I'm part kind of a chef, and I started doing dinner specials every night, and we started doing breakfast specials, and we started doing prime rib dinners, and, and it's blowing up now. We have all kinds of different groups – to come and do their uh, so you got the sober riders motorcycle group yep. sober riders come and do their their stuff there sometimes we got sjs that comes and does their fundraising there we do fundraising for the godfather foundation you know we do like yard sales once a week or a couple times a month really but so let me ask you this uh how long have you been sober now seven i just celebrated seven years may 5th mm, congratulations yeah, thank you how has life changed for you in those seven years Oh, well, seven years ago, I was hiding behind a dumpster, sticking a needle in my arm, trying to find a dime to get a bottle, living on the streets of Ogden. I had nowhere to go. Everybody's done it. And then I became a peer support, if you guys remember, and started working in recovery. And then I just dedicated my life. So that's all I do all day, every day still, is I've service to others, to service to the newcomers, service to be helping somebody that are getting off the streets, help them get a job, help them. You know, and that's what the Godfather Foundation is, is to help people to, when they get a job and they start paying their child support, and it's so hard to pay your bills sometimes and pay your child support, and it's just, we want to be able to step in and help you pay, not pay your child support, but help you meet your needs. Which is amazing to see how far you've come. Because if I remember anything from your story, one of the things I remember the most was you making shoes out of uh, old couch cushions. Was that correct? Or was it shoes? What were you making your shoes out of? Um, like I, I remember, <laughs> you were living on the streets, yeah, and, and you were you were making your own shoes that you're because you were using whatever you could to keep warm at night. Yeah, I'd, I'd I'd strap on whatever I could, but you know my shoes didn't ever come off, right? I mean, <laughs> unless I went to jail, I'd have my shoes on for month at a time, right? And so they'd get worn out, and I'd just you know put bags on them or whatever. But you know, I I was so busy trying to just run amok and thinking I was so cool on the streets with my swords and my knives and my leather jackets and thinking I was... Didn't you have a business card that yep. you put in people's... Jimmy Ray's <laughs> Collective Services. <laughs> yep. And I'd put it on the door and I'd, uh, I'd be coming back You're an entrepreneur. You. Yeah. And I still am. Still am. Yeah. Yeah. I it's love it. It's just about being of services to others. So You know, that's one of the things, Casey, that I, I think... I benefit more. Like I have an emotional boost every week when I come in here. And I think I've thought about that. Like, why is it? I mean, I, you know, obviously we are talking to people like yourselves who are in recovery and they're always doing it. It's the service part. Like I being around people that have dedicated their new life, their sober life to service. It's unbelievable. And people, the rest of the world doesn't think about service all the time, but people in recovery, I think are doing service every day and it is just so great. Somebody once said on the podcast, I can't remember who it was, but they said, if I worry about somebody else, I can't worry about myself. Yep. How true is that? And so if I make that the focus of my day to day actions, then I don't have any time to play the victim and feel bad for myself. If I'm out there yep. helping others, then, you know, karma's huge in the recovery world. Definitely. You know, and so if you put it out there, it'll come back to you. Yeah, I love that. Well, if you do the next right thing, the next right thing's going to do you. And there's truly nothing better than sitting down with somebody that's just coming off the streets at the Alana Club or first time meeting and you give them a really nice meal. We we make really nice meals like high end stuff. I was a chef in Alaska and a chef in Snow Basin and stuff like that and I got another guy that works there now that was a chef and we give the new guy a meal and the look on their face when they're sitting there eating this stuffed French toast or or something just really just blows their mind and and they can't even believe they're having it and we're sitting there with them and we get to, we get to share their their newcomer program with them and tell them this is what you can have every day 
Well, it doesn't you know get any better now. Riley, it's so good to see you out and thriving and doing wonderful things. And it was a blessing that I ran into you in the gym. And I'm so thankful that you're willing to come in again today. And yeah. I can't wait to hear Tia's story. What if, just back to the Godfather Foundation, what if somebody out there listening wants to donate to that or help with that? How would they do Well, that? we're working on that right now. I do have a letter and, and, and the bank account and everything. So you can just donate it through that. I got the website up finally. And it's... It's been, you know, I'm recovering addict, so I don't really know what I'm doing when it comes to it, but it is legal. <laughs> <laughs> Which is really cool because I found out what 501c3 means. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Most but it of, is legal. <laughs> most, adults, most adults don't know what they're doing. As long as it's legal, they're going to be fine. Right. So what's that website so people can find it? Godfatherfoundation.com. Perfect. I love it. Making yeah. an offer you can't refuse. Stick around. More fun for Project Recovery on the way and it's Tia's story next. Hey, welcome back to Project Recovery. I'm Casey Scott. That's Dr. Matt Woolley. Also, the podcast brought to you by our friends at Big O Tires. Yeah, get your tires there. Hey, it's a good time to do it. I actually got new tires for my pickup truck. We talked about that. Did you? I went down there to the Big O and Bountiful. And they said, hey, Dr. Matt. No. Uh, <laughs> they didn't know who I was. Kind of like you didn't nope. know Riley? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, it was a little bit like that, except for they'd never met me before. Oh, so. yeah. <laughs> hey, well, I'm introducing you to the, this person for the first time. Okay. This is Tia Zangraff. Oh, I recognize her. She was on the show. Yeah, you met her earlier. Yeah. Oh, that's right. She's <laughs> yeah, in yeah. the other chair. Yeah. Uh, Tia, how old are you? I am 34. How long have you been sober? I just got two years, uh, June 22nd. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. And uh, we heard another uh, saying while the mics were off, and it was, if you're scared, do it scared. It's what we're trying to do here. <laughs> and so when you first found out you were going to come on the podcast, it was a little scary. Mm -hmm. What what part of it's scary for you? Um, just I guess just putting myself out there and, and putting my story out there for everybody to see <laughs> so you're ready so uh, we're gonna do it so where does the story of tia begin uh the very beginning sure <laughs> i think you know and maybe people will find this interesting we always feel like it's important to find out where you came from and where you started so people can get a better idea of your childhood and maybe things that shaped or things that people can relate to so yeah let's start at the beginning definitely so um i grew up in ogden utah been there my whole life. Uh, I come from a long line of uh, drug addicts, alcoholics. Um, you know, my, my family is very small. Uh, but growing up, we always, you know, my, my mom was in, re or in her addiction and, and was using all the time. And so it was just pretty much me and my brother. Um, now, I, I want to stop you there because, you know, I come from a long line of addicts and alcoholics. Mm -hmm. At what age do you think you realized that your parents were different than other parents? Well, at eight years old, I wrote in my journal that I thought my mom sold drugs and my, my uncle had found it. Uh, so pretty young. And so what was your childhood? You said a lot of times it was just you and your brother. Did you feel like it was just you and your brother against the world? Well, I felt like it was me against the world. My brother is Down syndrome. And so uh, any attention that we did get, I felt like it was all for him. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like he was the favorite and the one that was most loved. And, you know, and so that really, it affected me in a lot of ways, especially as I got older. So with a parent who's using and a brother with special needs, that might have been a lonely way to grow up. It felt like it. Uh, you know, I had a neighbor that had a couple of kids and, you know, so every other weekend I get to go and hang out with them. And But for the most part, I mean, just I guess I remember sitting at my mom's bedroom door knocking on it, waiting for her to come out. Oh, and so at eight, you scribble in your journal that I think my mom's a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. And uh, was there a conversation had after that? Uh, my uncle absolutely ripped into me and, and my mom bought me this uh, really big stuffed animal and I named him Lovables. I still have the thing too. Um, and she sat down and kind of talked to me a little bit about it. And, but I don't, that's about as far as I remember into that. Well, first of all, what's your uncle doing reading your journal? Right. Right. <laughs> I want to know what's going on there. Um, did you understand what that meant? Do you think? Like, did you feel like 
Like, do you remember the feeling around thinking my mom's selling drugs? Or is it something that you just regurgitated? Because I remember when my son was probably a little younger than eight, he said, my dad's a drunk. And I know drunk wasn't in his vocabulary. So I knew that he was saying what somebody else had said. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so I remember, and, and, and it broke my heart. And I had to sit down and talk to him. And I go, hey, do you know what this means? You know, and, and kind of, you know, not defend myself, but, you know, kind of walk him through where I'm at and where we are and where we're going. But I knew that that wasn't in his vocabulary. Right. And that probably is what make would make the most sense is somebody had said it and I kind of just figured it out, you know, I, mm-hmm. but I knew it was bad. I knew it was wrong. So do you remember the first time that you tried drugs and alcohol? Uh, so the first time I tried alcohol, I was in foster care uh, for my second time and, and we were at... Uh, family reunion for their family and uh we snuck in the back and stole a bunch of wine and and went and got drunk <laughs> and what age were you uh i was 12 i believe foster care two different times can you tell us how you ended up in foster care uh so the first time i was i was younger um and my mom needed some help and so she took us to to dcfs um and then the second time was for the drug use and uh, some people that had been around that shouldn't have been. Okay. And so at 12, you guys do what, I, I, not a lot, but some kids do, are inquisitive about alcohol, sneak in the back door, try some wine. Yeah. Now, the thing that I'm interested in is we've had a lot of people who have sat in that chair where you're sitting right there and kind of described the feeling the first time they tried drugs or alcohol. Do you remember a feeling change in the body? Not with that time. Uh, When I was 14, the first time I smoked weed, uh, I absolutely remember it that time. And and I loved that out of control feeling. Uh, So mine was the out of control. I know a lot of people do it to be in control, Um, but I just liked that I didn't have to care about stuff. I think I'd like to talk to Dr. Matt a little bit about that for a second because that's interesting that she loved the out of control. And in my addiction, I used to say that I thrived in the out of control. That's what I really sought. And that was my happy place. Here in my sobriety and my recovery, I, that, that's not true. I, I, I like a routine. I'm a big <laughs> fan of you know doing the same thing over and over again. But what makes somebody seek that out of control feeling? So I'd have to ask a question to both of you. So what else? So you're out of control, which can also sound not good, Mm -hmm. but obviously it felt good to both of you. So what else comes with that feeling of being out of control? Freedom. Just not caring. Yeah, there you go. And so I think a lot of times people who, when they're not drinking or using in any way, they maybe have a lot of anxious thoughts. They have a lot of stressful thoughts. They they feel controlled by mm. the situation or, or things around them or by, you know, just their emotions. And then when you feel out of control, it's sort of a freedom. It's a release of all that pressure from either you put on yourself or society or, or family situations. And it's like, like you said, I just don't have to care. I feel free. And uh, I think for... You, Casey, like in your job, how did that feeling, you know, how did it work for you? I know we say things work till they don't, but like, it what gave did me it, notoriety, it gave me accolades, and uh, and it was almost appreciated. I feel like it was kind of expected, expected, and sort of magnifying the qualities you already had. Like it was a little bit easier to just be your fun self. It gave me the license to. <laughs> try things that I felt inside me. Mm-hmm. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, like, I it mean, kind of takes the governor off your behavior. Yeah, right? you know yeah. what I mean? And then I could start to hone those things that yeah. people liked and disliked yeah. and, and be able to figure out where I wanted to take it. Yeah, up until they tossed you out. Yeah, yeah. and they did toss me out multiple <laughs> yeah. times. No, I know, and, and that's the thing about, that's the deception of that experience is, you know, when you're first drinking for the night or first using for the night and you're just barely into it, it does feel like, oh, I can shed all this control. I feel out of control. I feel free. I can be my real self or try fun things. And then as the night goes on, hmm, it turns. You know, it's interesting you say that because there's a large portion of the state of Utah that have 
fun drinking stories with Casey Scott. <laughs> yeah. But true. there's also a large yeah, portion yeah. of Utahns who have had a miserable yeah. drinking experience with Casey Scott. Who, even if you just brought up my name, they would be like, that guy. Mm-hmm. And, d- just. and I think you've mentioned on the show, or to me at least, that there are so many great people who've been forgiving of you yeah that, you know but there are still some that aren't or, and, and that's okay yeah and it is i yeah, know you're yeah, truly you're, okay you're, with yeah, that yeah. it's like i can't but change your mind their experience probably was pretty bad yeah pretty negative so at 14 you tried marijuana and you said you really really liked it oh yeah definitely and and pretty much it was on from there when you say it was on from there, what does that mean? Because for those who listen to this podcast, a lot of them aren't addicts in active okay. addiction. Uh, it's loved ones of addicts. And so when it's on, does that mean you're now searching for anything that's going to give you the same kind of feeling? Yeah, you know, I, I believe so. You know, I definitely started drinking and, and the weed started and, um, you know, and, and that was an every weekend thing. And for a long time, I just thought I drank socially. It was just with friends, and it was just this. And, and then it goes hard, back to what Dr. Matt find. said. Oh, go ahead. You know, it goes back to what you said. It works until it doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you can keep those demons at a bay, and, and you, but then slowly the window starts to get closer and closer. Exactly. Was it hard to find weed when you were 14? No. Yeah. No, nope, yeah. everybody had it. <laughs> and that was 20 years ago, and it's even more so today. Oh, yeah, definitely more so today. And so you're drinking on the weekends. Uh, are you still with your foster parents or are you back home? No. Nope. So my mom did get custody of me and my brother back. Um, and I was miserable. I hated her and I was angry. And, you know, um, so at, at 15, I had taken about 60 Tylenol. Mm. Uh, yeah. That's I ended dangerous. up, you know, trying to, to hurt myself and got done with that and and a month later i was pregnant with my first daughter um at what age at 15 Mm -hmm. i had her at 16 and too much two months after she was born she had passed away Mm -hmm. Uh, so i was a child trying to raise a child bearing a child right and so oh my goodness and losing a child can you talk about what caused her to pass away um it was sids okay yeah yeah Oh, I'm sorry for your loss. That's a hard thing for even a mature, well-supported adult to manage. Right. Did you get any help with your grief? No. Uh, nope. Pretty much just went to start using cocaine and starting to do the party thing again, you know, ecstasy and meth. And so it just kind of started or, yeah, push started it more, you know. Uh, so by the time you were 16... You had gotten pregnant, had a or had a suicide attempt, gotten pregnant, lost a child, and were now doing pretty much all the hard drugs that you could find. Yeah, yep, pretty wow. much. <laughs> That's a lot for anybody, especially somebody at a young yeah. age of 16. Yeah. And so, like, I'm not a psychiatrist or a therapist, but it sounds like uh, it escalated your use. Definitely. And was that... Uh, uh, you trying to escape or numb or run from the pain or was there a thought process that went into it? Um, I definitely just wanted it to go away. I, you know, that pain has, I mean, obviously it's not something that's ever going to go away, but for many years I had blamed myself um, and, and I ran with it. You know, I didn't want to feel it. I wanted it to go away. Um just anything to help. You know, it's interesting, Matt, because for an addict, and I can speak because I am one, a lot of times what addicts are looking for is uh, an excuse or a free pass. And I'm not saying that's what that is, but you know what I mean? It's like, hey, this has happened to me, so what did you think I was going to do? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I, you, you didn't, I didn't have any counseling. I didn't have any of the tools. Human beings are good at justifying our yes. behaviors, right? And um I mean, that's some real trauma that you're describing. Real, I mean, trauma starting in, even if your household wasn't super functional, being taken to foster care is traumatic. And Mm -hmm. like you said, you're angry at your mom and you probably had some pretty conflictual feelings about, you know, she's my mom, I love her. She's my mom, I hate her, you know? And and that kind of trauma from from foster care, from the child losing the child, um, that's a lot to try to manage even with a lot of support, but on your own, I mean, at 16, I had a hard time getting up and going to school on time. And 
that was about all I had to worry about. And, you know, there's so many young people out there with real trauma, big T trauma in their lives. And uh, it makes sense that we would want to escape that. Any yeah. person wouldn't want to feel those feelings. So I think it's probably a desperate need to feel better. Yeah. And then after a while, once an addiction kicks in, it might also be a rock solid reason or excuse to continue because it, she can sit here, Casey, and honestly say to Matt Woolley, you don't know what I've been through. And it's the, the answer is absolutely I do not. So, Tia, how long are you running and gunning for? Uh, so I ended up pregnant again, right? Uh, not even a year later. Um, and I, I did got through that pregnancy, and I did really well for the first two months. And then as soon as that my, my second daughter hit two months, I started getting high. Um, and, and I did that for about another year, you know, I... It was just doing meth and drinking and partying. Um, and then uh, when she was about 10 months old, I started doing heroin. And that lasted about three weeks. And she was taken away from me because I couldn't wake up to her crying. Um, so she went into foster care herself. Uh, luckily, I had family that was able to take her. Um and, and that was the first time I had went to the women's retreat. I was able to get into family drug court. And, you know, I, I jumped through all the hoops and did all the things that they asked. Uh, but I was still drinking on the weekends because I wasn't an alcoholic, right? Uh. <laughs> so let me ask you, uh, because you say, you know, I did all the things they asked. I jumped through all the hoops. Mm -hmm. Did you go into it with the mindset that I've just got to get through this or I want to change? Does that make sense? Oh, I just I just wanted to get through it. I didn't I had no desire uh, to do change anything. Really, I just wanted to get my kid back and uh, show face and, and make it look pretty. And, you know, the day I graduated, I was getting high again. So the day you graduate, you're getting high again. Mm -hmm. um, How old are you by this time? I was 20, 20, 21. And uh, how long did you, you you keep that going for? I went on for another four years. Um, you know, in crappy relationship after crappy relationship, right? And ended up pregnant with my third daughter. Um, I used through that whole pregnancy, uh, a lot of guilt and a lot of shame that comes with that. Um, her, her father had ended up going to prison when I was about six months, um, pregnant. And so there's just a lot of, you know what I mean? Just trying to make it feel okay. I guess it was, it was a tough time. Um, ended up in a really crappy relationship again, you know, very abusive, uh, in my eyes, he attempted to try and kill me a couple of times, you know, and, um, you know, and I, I did that until it was about 2014. I think I was 24. I went, I, I wanted help. You know, my kids, my mom had actually taken my kids to DCFS. Uh, so that was their second time going in, right? My second time for my oldest daughter, which she was five and, um, that was the first time I wanted to do something to change. Uh, so I went to Tranquility House, you know, I got kicked out, I left, but I kept going back just trying to, just trying to grasp it, any part of it. Um, and I did really well, but I still didn't have that belief that I was an alcoholic. I thought I could drink, you know, I thought I could drink. I did, could do it on the weekends. I could do it socially. I never did it by myself. Like all these excuses that we make, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so you, so you kept the hard drugs uh, away. Yep, I kept them away for about seven years. And in that seven years, did you have some success? Did you get your kids back? Um, and, and and life seemed pretty good. Yeah, I got my kids back. We got back into a place. I, you know, I was working and and things seemed all right. Um, but I was drinking on the weekends and partying, of course, and uh, you know, just doing really stupid stuff, jumping out of cars, going 70 miles an hour, um, walking into people's houses and just sitting down while I'm drunk and just putting myself in some very, very unsafe situations. Sure. <laughs> and so then how does that end? Uh, that ended with a needle in my arm. 
you know, I got drunk and wanted back to, I went back to my kids' dad, uh, and I, I wanted him to love me, right? He's getting high, and I just, I wanted him to love me, and I thought that that would be the best way to do it. And that didn't end so well. <laughs> no, it, no, it ended up great. You know, here we are. <laughs> So walk me through that. Did you have a rock bottom? I mean, because I'm listening to your story, Tia, and you're a beautiful young lady, and you've uh, lived a life that, like Dr. Matt says, I, I can't even understand. Uh, and But you know what's great is that you're here today to tell your story, but uh, where did it turn around for you? Um, so I, we did that for about, I did that for about three years. The, you know, I started... I started shooting dope and, and started doing heroin, um, fentanyl. Um, my kids had willingly moved out of my house and in with my mom. Um, and and we're, na- we're neighbors, right? And I mean, I wouldn't see my kids, but walking outside once every couple of months. Um, but your kids said, Mom, we want to go live with Grandma. Th- they didn't even say that. They packed their stuff and left. And even though you were next door, you didn't see them very often, it sounds like. Yep. Yeah, they they didn't want no part to do with me. Um not not as much for my younger daughter. Uh she would still come home and uh she would be left upstairs while I was getting high or doing whatever I was doing, you know. Um it put a really big strain on that relationship with me and my kids, you know. It turned out to my older daughter hating me the same way I hated my mom. Right? And just that cycle just kept going and going. Um, and it was really hard. Uh, I ended up getting pulled over and they uh, came in and searched my house. And, you know, I found, um, they'd found, they thought it was cocaine, but it was fentanyl. And, and just all my other, all my drugs, right? Um, and I pretty much begged the drug drudge to let me take drug court again. Um Still not, I mean, I had that desire, that desperation was definitely there, but I didn't think that it would be possible for me. You know, that I had absolutely no self-worth, no no love for myself. Um, I wanted to just die, but with my daughter passing away, if I committed suicide, I didn't think I would ever see her again. You know, those, those that's what I had to tell myself to keep going. Um, you know, and I, I did the drug court thing and uh, got high and, you know, I forced one of my, forced my kids to come home, and they said that I was going to go to jail again. And right then, I was like, I I can't. You know, I just got them both home. Like I will do whatever you want, and that's that's what I did. I did whatever they asked. You know, I I got myself involved. I would go to the Allen Club every morning, um, and talk to the old timers there and get their their advice and suggestions and. Whatever the hell it took, I was going to do. That's and so that's how you got sober, was drug court, the Alano Club, um, and just doing whatever you needed to do. Yeah, yeah. It, whatever they said, I was willing to try it, you know, because my way wasn't working. And I, I didn't have any idea of how to make it work, you know. Throughout this time, my mom did go into recovery herself, Um you know, and so I watched her kind of do it. And I I had been around the Alano Club since I was like 11. So I, I knew the avenues and I knew, you know, but you couldn't convince me that I was like you. You know, you were different. Yeah, I was, I was different. I was not better, but I. You don't know my life. Yeah. And if you went through, you would get high, too. You know what I mean? If you went through what I did, you would do it, too. And that was I, I lived by that definitely victimized myself for a very long time at what point did you so you've alluded a couple times to the fact that you convinced yourself you were didn't have a drinking problem Mm -hmm. and it sounds like you did at was there a point where you realized i can't it's not just the drugs i have to stop drinking as well was was it when you started heroin again did you also drink or does that then the drinking goes away yeah, when I started doing meth again, I mean, I would drink here and there, um, but it, it pretty much went away. 
for the most part, you know. And that was how I, I realized that I am an alcoholic, you know, not only with all the crazy stuff that I would do and, and the things I would do to myself or other people, but because eventually it still led me down the same road I was trying to stay away from, right? It led me back to, to drug the heart, well, any drugs, actually. So when you were talking about those years where you just drank, one of the thoughts that came to my mind was that um, you know, marijuana has been labeled as a gateway drug, but the reality is everybody has their own gateway something, mm-hmm. right? And uh, often it is another substance like marijuana or alcohol or, or pills. It could also be food. It can also be behaviors. But we delude ourselves into thinking, well, I can do this thing oh, yeah. and it's not going to. That's OK, because I don't have a problem with that. But but we're using it to sort of compensate for those uh, addictive it's tendencies, the whole, It's right? the whole thing with California sober. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? That's People going, I, you know, I, I just smoke weed. Yeah. Now, I'm not here to say anything about your recovery. Mm-hmm. If it works for you, it works for you, and I'm not here to tell you how to do your recovery. But what I see with alcohol and other things is it's a placeholder. It's a placeholder for you like, hey, look, I'm, I'm, I'm hooked on oxys. I can't get oxys. I'm going to drink. And I, and I don't have a problem with drinking, so I'm just going to... But it's a placeholder. It's the into, lesser of two evils idea. But then eventually... But you're not here to tell people that I am. <laughs> so I will tell you that you, all of us, whether you think you have problems or not in any of these areas, really should take inventory and be honest with yourself and realize, oh, maybe I'm doing California sober because that sounds kind of cool and sexy and that's what people do. The truth is I'm just hooked on weed. I mean, just be honest with yourself. Just like, I can't get through my day without this thing. Whether it's the 15th time you've gone through one of the soda places, drive throughs around here, or, you know, it's the hours Shopping you spend. On Amazon. Yeah. Yeah, I, I actually have a lady now that I've been working with finally convinced her to get into a Shoppers Anonymous mm-hmm. uh, program because she just can't handle not spending. That is her thing. And she's like, well, I'm not really hurting anyone. And I'm like, well, but... You know, you just got your car repoed, so maybe we should talk about it. Right. You know, like the losing that finance. So we all have things. Sure. And I'm not, you know, I like to pick on marijuana for lots of reasons, but, and I'm not picking on marijuana. I'm picking on the fact that if you're honest with yourself, you have a gateway thing. Yeah. And that's, you may be choosing the lesser of two evils. I'm not going to argue that it's better to smoke weed than, you know, shoot heroin. Shoot heroin. Yep. I would agree with that. But it's still not the best. It's no. better, but it's not the best. Right. But that's the beauty in recovery is everybody gets to look different. Everybody, you know what I mean? Nobody's recovery is the same as the other right. person's. Uh, for me to get off heroin, I had to do the. Uh, Suboxone? Su- no, not Suboxone. It was the shot. Um, Vivitrol? Supplicate shot. Okay. You know, and I, I had to do that for about seven months for me to be able to, that's a great, to get it, you know. That's a great avenue to get sober. I think. Yeah. And, and it was something that I needed to do for myself. You know, it, does everybody have to do it that way? No. But, and that's why and I love recovery. work for everybody? No. no. Yeah. You know, um, it worked for me and it, it was a life t- or a game changer for me. Yeah. yeah and it I, works for a lot of people. I've got a follow up question and, um, I know you were willing to do whatever they tell you to do, whether it was the old timers or whoever it may be, drug court, whatever. Mm-hmm. We've already established that you've had some big T, big trauma in your life. Have you sat down and talked with a therapist or worked through some of that stuff? Definitely. Um, I mean, I've been in, in and out of therapy my whole life for sexual abuse, um, teen stuff you know what I mean I, I've been in and out of therapy my whole life um, but this time when I was in drug court uh, I really focused on myself uh, my self-worth you know loving myself just learning what boundaries are and how to set them um, what I'm what I'm willing to give and take you know um, because I mean if, if you gave me the right attention and told me you loved me then I would do whatever it took to keep you there you know I just want to feel love like most people do, um, but I would I would kill myself to love you, and I didn't know how to do that properly. Um, self love and self worth is so important. Um, I remember staring in the mirror and the mirror looking back and going, "How could you love this guy?" 
Yeah. You know what I mean? After yeah. all the things that he's done and, and, and this, and, and, and how can this guy be worth it? But to find that and, and realize that there is beauty in there and there is worth. And, and sometimes that's that's the toughest sell right there, huh? It because is. Because <laughs> we're the only ones that have known all of what we've done. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you want to go to people like, if you knew. You, so I was talking to this almost, me. almost 20 year old recently, and he had an epiphany. And he shared it with me right in that moment. And he said, I don't talk to anybody in a mean way except for myself. Yeah. And it was just so profound for him. And the truth is, I, I think we're all guilty of that on some level. But especially if we grow up wanting normal, healthy connections and we don't have them. Right. And as I think about your story, I think I'm so glad that you're working on some of those things now at your in therapy not just now that you're in you're sober and you're in recovery but really working on catching up on your psychological and personal development because you know how you missed out on a lot of those normal healthy psychologically developmental milestones you know and we don't think of that very often we just think about physical developmental milestones mm-hmm. you know you know your mom marks your height on the wall or whatever it is you know did you go to the doctor and you know but uh, the psychological, emotional, interpersonal things that we learn when we're children and teenagers set us up for healthy relationships as adults. And if we never really got to have that, then you're right. You're searching for love and connection and, you, and you're blind. You don't know how to get it. And so we do things that are seem helpful in the moment, but are often self-destructive. Definitely. And I think a a way for me to kind of see that now is, you know, um, if it's not something that I would want somebody to do to my kids, then why would I want it to be something that's done to me? And so if I can't necessarily figure out if it's the right thing or, you know what I mean? I just, that's the question I asked myself. Different perspective, right? Yeah. Yeah. So how are things with your kids? They are absolutely amazing. Um, I have, a very open and honest relationship with both of my kids. Um, you know, the the relationship I have with my older daughter uh, has just come so, so very far. Um, I've always been close with, with my youngest, you know, um, and they weren't near as strained as they were with my older one. You know, she comes to me with, with issues. She comes to me when we're having a problem. She's willing to open up, you know. And even that relationship that I had with my mom, like she, my mom's one of my best friends. You know, when I got the call to, to come do the show yesterday, she was the first person I called. And I was like, Mom, mm-hmm. <laughs> I need you. Like, because <laughs> this isn't something I would normally do. And she's like, honey, your experience, strength, and hope, and you have something to give, you know. And, and it's just... It's amazing. I, I am so grateful that I was able to kind of grasp onto this and, and whatever today brings, you know, um, I'm willing to, to work through it, at least for today. I think your story is amazing and inspiring. And I think um, what you have gone through is terrible yet amazing. You know what I mean? To see you yeah. walk through the fire and come out the other side is just a testament to the strength of recovery and what can happen. How does your life look today? Simple. <laughs> and, and a lot of love and support. You know, I, I get up and I'm the treasurer of the Alano Club. So I have somebody else trusting me with their money, which baffles me in itself. Um, you know, I get up every morning and, and I, I go to the Alano Club and I do whatever paperwork I have and I sit with my old timers every morning still. Um, and, you know, I'm there if somebody needs something and I go to work to my my uh, paying job, <laughs> you know, and then I go home and, and make dinner and spend time with my kids and I'm happy today, you know, and I never thought I'd be able to say that and and honestly mean it. And I really think that you're breaking the cycle. I really hope so. And if not, then I'm at least teaching them that there is another way. That's exactly what I was thinking. 
In fact, uh, I saw a meme, so I thought of you, Casey. Yeah. <laughs> that, and it had like a broken chain and it talked about the meme said something to the effect of, you know, you know, intergenerational trauma can be broken by you or something like that. Oh. And that was what came to my mind when it's like now these girls have a mother and a grandmother in their lives who are healthy, sober and modeling a life of recovery, you know, happiness, consistency. Mom gets up every morning. Mom comes home every day and makes dinner and these kinds of things. And uh, the the grandchildren and great grand the people you'll never know are benefiting in the future from what you and your mom have done now. And I, hopefully that's something to think about that is beyond a power. It's like the person who plants a tree they're never going to sit under, right? Right. You know, and it's that idea of like future generations will be likely so much better off because of what you and your mom are doing now. That is beautiful. It gave me all kinds of chills. <laughs> well, Tia, you are beautiful. And thank you for stopping by and sharing your story. I know it's going to help so many people out there. Uh, if people want more information, of course, we'll have a link underneath here for the Alano Club in Ogden. Congratulations on celebrating 77 years. Uh, if you don't know the Alano Club, look them up and find one in your neighborhood. Uh, it's an amazing place that's doing wonderful What'd you things. call them? The Country Club for, oh, addicts. Yeah. for Addicts. I love yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Come there and hang out. I don't think they have a golf course. Well, that's coming. Yeah. We could probably make one. There you go. Because addicts can do just yeah. about that's, anything. That's true. Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you for stopping by and listening to another episode of Project Recovery. I love you and I mean it. And in case you forgot, Project Recovery is what? It's a KSL podcast. That was the name was Riley. I, oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I think I've met him before. Multiple times. <laughs>